And it's also a pleasure for me to welcome uh, the first, uh, the uh, first or the last, uh, also uh, invited speaker of this session, who is a professor, uh, Verena Winiwarter, and she's a professor of uh, environmental history at the Institute of Social Ecology Faculty of Inter Interdisciplinary Study Vienna. At the same time, she's a dean of the Faculty of Interdisciplinary Studies at the Alpen Adria University of Klagenfurt. And um, before she starts to talk, I also would like to say a few words on her history. She has a technical background, and background in medieval history and communication, and later she has uh, defended her habilitation in human ecology. Uh, Verena is co-founder and uh, former president of the European Society for Environmental History. And she's going to talk to us on a very interesting topic, which is the interdisciplinary look back Environmental histories of water management and governance. Please, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tatiana, and thanks to ESF for uh, finding a historical perspective a necessary ingredient of management and governance. Um, many managers don't think so yet. I am going to spend the next hour. And if, if I say anything which is totally um, in, incomprehensible, raise your hand and ask a question. I'm trying <coughs> not to use any jargon because I think jargon is detrimental to interdisciplinary discourse. But I might fall into the trap of jargon. And if I do so, just raise your hand and I'll explain. Um, and I'm going to spend this hour with, um, with three different things. First, I was aware of the fact that we would have 11 case studies, and I would like to place these case studies in the larger framework of uh, global facts about water. The second part, I'm going to try to explain in the, in the sort of, um, in this uh, idea that uh, what Mats talked this morning, some things can be explained I think that some of the water problems can be explained. One of the explanations is, of course, that it's a multifunctional resource. And because you can use it either for one or the other things, but seldom you can use it for both things. So you can either have a dam or you can have recreation on a natural river. Because of that nature of the resource, it is bound to be conflicting. The second reason is that what we've been doing here this whole day is to talk about water. Now the message is there is no water. Water doesn't exist as such. Water is part of ecosystems, of rivers, of estuaries, of deltas, of groundwater reservoirs, of the seas. It doesn't come as such. And because it doesn't come as such, we don't have limitless options what we can do with it. Because by drawing water out of an ecosystem, we are changing this ecosystem. Um, so, so much for the overall idea. I will go through these water facts. I will give you an explanation. And I have prepared five case studies, which, I, which each of them is nice and explains some part of what I'm saying on a global level in much more detail, lets you see the complexity. The first one on a Tibetan wetland, I really want to tell you, and all the others I can go to if I am fast enough with the first part, and we can stop after each and every case study. And there's only three, I think, slides for conclusions, and I can skip to them anytime. And if you're wondering why I'm standing here and the computer is standing down there, um, this presentation is filmed uh, for the sake of this uh, three minute something, and therefore I have agreed to stand here to move a little bit to make the movie more pleasant, <laughs> but not to move too far away from the technology so that it can actually be filmed. The fact finders in my story on facts and water include what you could call an interdisciplinary group. There are aquatic and terrestrial biologists, there are economists, there are chemists, there are geographers, historians, and many more. 
Most of the images, unless otherwise stated, are from a wonderful resource, which many of you might actually know from the Grid Arendal Image Bank, which is a UNESCO, um, a UNEP, sorry, UNEP um, <laughs> initiative by the Norwegian government. In the last 100 years, global water um, use has increased 18-fold. From 1890 to 1990, it increased ninefold, and again <coughs> ninefold from 1900 to 2010. 1990 to 2010, this should read. Um, and you can see this graph on the, on the screen here. Um, what we actually can see is that this is the overall world, and then you can see that Asia comes first and then comes uh, North America, Europe, and there's not very much uh, in Africa going on because, because, why? I mean, Africa's a huge continent. Because in Africa, irrigation agriculture is not as prominent as on other places in the earth. Now, to the multifunctionality of water, you can see several uses. Power generation, water for industry, for cooling, for processes, for agriculture, for human people in, in villages, in urban areas, as wildlife habitat and for recreation. Now, one thing is missing here, and that is the fishes, and the mollusks, and the shrimp, and the seaweed. Um, because many modern water managers don't think of water as a source for food anymore, at least not when they talk fresh water. When they talk um, the sea, they think about fish, but they don't think about freshwater fish. Okay, um, if you look at the evolution of global water use, you can immediately see that agriculture is by far the largest water user in the world. And all these graphs on this slide go from 1900, and the last one is a forecast for 2025. And you can also see these shaded areas here is what is wasted. We had one discussion um, on one of the papers said that there are leaky pipelines. Leaky pipelines actually make up for a lot of water use. Um, and evaporation, which is a big problem of irrigated agriculture, isn't even on here. Now, what can we learn from this? We can immediately learn from this that if all the consumers in the world sort of behaved a little better, would it help much? No, because agriculture is the largest water user in the world. And given the fact that only 2.5% of the Earth's water are fresh water, of which 70% are frozen in the ice caps of Antarctica and Greenland, which leaves the remaining 30%, which is when you calculate less than 1% of total water resources worldwide available for consumption, it is interesting to know that 87% is allocated to agricultural purposes. Irrigated land, we can't abandon that because currently it produces 40% of our food on only 17% of the world's <coughs> land. The largest share of irrigated cropland is in Asia, where you have more than 30% of all agricultural land is irrigated land. We can't change that from one day to the other. So actually, what we can do to save water is pretty limited. But even if consumers have only a small fraction of the direct water use. They have a very large part in the water footprint because of their consumption of food, because food is incorporated water. And what you can see here is the newest uh, data from uh, 200, uh, 2012, a global assessment of the water footprint of farm animal products that was published in Ecosystems. And you can see that cereals have a water footprint, so um, each, um, each food consumes cu cubic meters of water per ton. So for each ton of cereals, um, 
1,644 cubic meters. For each ton of milk, um, we're here at 1,020. For each ton of beef, 15,450. So stopping to eat beef is actually a much better way to conserve water <laughs> than to sort of um, flush your toilet less. <laughs> these are uncontested data. There is not much um, uncertainty about these anymore. If, yes? The meter cubed of, of, I mean, if you stopped eating meat, beef, fine, but milk, the meter cubed of milk is not just what one cow would produce over its lifespan. So it's not really a fair to comparison to say if you get, if you stop beef, farming's fine because you still got farming for, for milk. Well, there's a big difference. If you yeah. if you feed cattle for consumption of the meat, you feed them with soy, and you feed them with grains. If you let animals pasture on rough pasture, then, then you are actually using land which cannot be used in another way. So milk animals, which are up on alpine pastures, are totally different stories from, from be beef cattle, which is fed by imported uh, soybeans. So that you, cattle is not cattle. You can't keep most cattle out on, on pastures over the winter. You have to keep them indoors because of various environmental legislation. So they do have to still eat. Uh, grain and uh, stored. <laughs> I, I to, well, I mean, you can actually diminish your environmental uh, footprint. The, the, the really good thing to do is to commit suicide, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. That yeah. actually <laughs> delimits your footprint yeah. very much. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. But the point is you have a choice in how much beef yeah. you eat, and that is not just it, there is no link of 100% no. between no, milk and beef. Just, okay? Vegetarians should also feel guilty. And that's the point. Vegetarians, <laughs> if, if, I don't think that we should feel guilty. We should become aware of something. Yeah. I'm not talking guilt here, because guilt has never helped in history. <laughs> yes? You have to shout. Yeah, I okay, have to shout. The figures there are global, because footprint is my insecurity. area. The figures there refer to global figures. Yes. You can distinguish between green, blue, and gray, different types of water. Blue is dedication, green is the rate of uh, water. <laughs> and these are just global figures. From country to country, you can see differences in the no. production system. So, what that's. And actually, I mean, you, you need to take this for what it's worth. This is my take on giving you a global overview. And on each of these, you can go into the intricacies of the particular case, and then we can become more complex. But that's not what I want here. If we go into <laughs> residential use of water, um, in the United States, um, around the year 2000, each and every household used 200 gallons per day. That's more than 600 liters. And if you look at these, at these graphs, what you can see is that dishwashers are actually not the culprit. <laughs> um, toilet flush is 26% of indoor water use, but indoor water use is less than half of the entire water use because almost 60% goes into outdoor water use in the United States, people washing their cars and people irrigating their lawns. Um, and there's, actually we're happy that people use about 20% of their water for washing themselves and 22 for their clothes. But the clothes washing thing could actually technologically be decreased a lot because you can build washing machines which use a lot less water. Okay. Now if you look at this here, this is, this is trying to make my point about rivers. Um, the redder this picture gets, the more moderated, the more changed by humans are the rivers. And if you look at where the green rivers are, the point is they are there where the land can't be used for anything else. Um, or where in Alaska, there is a conscious decision not to go into hydropower, but keep some of those streams um, available as natural streams. And even the Amazon rainforest is already moderately affected. That are data from 2004 
and the world has not gone down, I suppose the rent is actually going up. What does that mean? Let me give you one example. This is the destruction of the Mesopotamian marshlands. You can see the marshlands in 1973 and in 2000. And what you can see is that there is only a little bit of permanent marsh left and there is absolutely no seasonal marsh left because this, although it looks similar, is dead or dry vegetation. Mm -hmm. And this has a very powerful story. Why the seasonal marshes? Because the whole idea of humans about nature is to keep it stable. What humans really can't tolerate is natural dynamics. So if it's a marsh and it's a marsh all year round, we can do nature protection on it. But if it's a marsh only half the year, we could use it for the other half of the year. There's a very powerful political story in this, of course. Now, this is the water scarcity index. Another, um, another attempt at giving you a global picture. This is the water stress indicator. How exploited are the different regions of the world in terms of water? It differs from the other picture in that those regions which have a natural abundance of rain are not under water stress. And you can also see that India is under severe water stress. And what you've heard about the north of China is also an area with severe water stress. Um, the WWF produces the, um, uh, the Living Planet Index, and the Living Planet Index is a, is a number uh, which gives you an idea how biodiversity has changed over time. Now this index has started here in the 1970s and it goes to 2000. And what you can easily see here is that the marine animals living planet index has been going down steadily. And the same is true for the freshwater index. And that's collecting data on several hundred species and trying to make sure that you have local differences incorporated, etc. This story here has been the mainstay of Paul Holm and his group for many years, um, trying to assess the historical data in a very, very long perspective here. And if you look at that, this picture becomes much more dire. Excuse me. Yes? Uh, I just wonder whether this is because of climate change or misuse or mismanagement. Really that is all together. I, they, for, the, for the WWF, it doesn't matter why biodiversity is threatened, because it doesn't matter to species. Hey, I've gone extinct because of climate change, or hey, I've gone extinct because of uh, habitat destruction, doesn't make much of a difference to a species going extinct. Global marine biodiversity and global freshwater biodiversity going down also has to do with, with fish catches. This is the global capture um, fisheries and aquatic production from 1950s onwards, and you can easily see that it has that we've increased production since the 1950s by a factor of six. There's not a single unexploited fishery on this planet. Not a single valuable fish species which has not already been tackled. And aquaculture, you see, is growing in importance. River fragmentation and flow regulation. This is, this is an old picture. That's a picture of, the, of 1998. And it talks about how many new dams were under construction in this single year. So you can actually see that we are still fragmenting rivers at a large scale. We have now become a geological force. When a geologist in time coming will look at the geological record, he or she will see what we've done from 1950s to probably the end of this century, 
2.3 gigatons, and that is a lot of sediment, is trapped every year in reservoirs. We have changed how sediment flows with the water. We are by means of trapping sediment endangering most of the deltas of the world, which are subsiding uh, at a much larger pace than they would if we still would supply the sediment. Now the bad part of this story is that deltas are places with high biodiversity and a lot of people live close to deltas. So if land subsides there, this is going to affect a large part of the population. <coughs> Bless you. This is a famous graph that um, a group of people led by Paul Grutzen, Will Steffen, and John McNeil put together uh, in one of their articles on the Anthropocene. And I'm not going to ask you even to read this eye test. What I'm going to show you is that water use is, changes in water use what are one. What is Anthropocene? What is Anthropocene? I'll get there, okay? <laughs> <laughs> what I want to show you is that the, the way we have changed our use of water is part of the great transformation that is named Anthropocene when humans have become a geological force of the earth. We are changing ecosystems worldwide to a degree that we can be measured in terms of geological data by means of sediment changes by means of all the things and by means of atmospheric changes. The, the presence of humans on the Earth is in the geological record. And that is why it's called not Holocene anymore, but Anthropocene. And the damming of rivers, water use, and the, the fully exploited fisheries, and our investment in coastal zone structures has gone up immensely the dams are counted here by the thousands from 1900 to 2000. There, the, this has increased 24-fold. Um, and I have 1950 here in these graphs because actually it's not industrialization as such, which started in the 19th century. It is the second half of the 20th century when all these, these parameters go up. Now this is over exponential growth. The earth is not growing. It's not even exponentially. It's not growing linear, it's not growing exponentially, it's not growing over exponentially. So it seems as if we are actually running into a problem here. And why do we do that? One of the insights of environmental history is that usually people innovate to reduce a particular type of risk and to increase the productivity of their systems. And which with each and every innovation, a new type of uncertainty is created. That is called the spiral of risk. And that is, that's not a natural law, but that is a pretty solid observation about social systems. Now one example, Neolithic Revolution. Natural abundance of resources is going up and down all the time. If you take care yourself rather than gathering what's there, you're planting, you can actually make the resource much more steadily. But with agriculture comes totally new types of uncertainty. For instance, pests. Now there's not anything nicer you can do to mice than to build a grain storage. If you don't have grain storage, your problem with grain eating uh, larger and smaller animals and, and, um, and uh, you know, bugs of all kinds is zero or very, very low. If you keep grain over the year to saw it in the next, in the next spring, you have a new type of problem. In 1973, do you remember 1973? No, why would you? In 1973, um, energy crisis, oil prices went up, okay? European governments found out that the oil price, when it went up, destabilized their economies. 
great idea, what would they do? They want to decouple their energy supply from fossil fuel. Smart. What did they invest in? Nuclear power. New types of uncertainty. And to all my knowledge, there's, there's not a single innovation that wouldn't confirm to this rule. Water is part of the whole. And if you look at these numbers here, they show you the 20th century world by numbers. And if we start here in 1890, this is an, this is an index number. So whatever was one in 1890 has then grown. We have managed to kill 97% of the finback whales. We've increased uh, population both of cattle and of humans fourfold. We've increased the population of pigs and our water use ninefold. We've increased the world economy 14-fold and urban population 13-fold. We have, we have been good at energy use because it only increased 16-fold, whereas total industrial output increased 40-fold. So all your efficiency gains are in the difference between those two numbers. And of course, with that came increased CO2 emission. So you, do you want an explanation? I would want one. <laughs> the single most important causal factor for this transformation is a change in the energy sources humans use. Fossil fuels made this unprecedented change in human life possible. And we are dealing with the side effects of over exponential growth. Among them, global warming, loss of biodiversity, pollution, and I think soil degradation are the most threatening. Soil degradation is usually not mentioned. And there are no easy solutions. But there are solutions. Before I go into solutions, let me try to give you another picture of this. This is the IPAT formula. The idea is that human impact is the product of how many we are, how rich we are, and what kind of technology we use. Has been invent it has been first published by Barry Commoner in the 1970s. And this is an ingenious graph that was made by National Geographic last year. They are trying to actually picture it. Now have a look here. Can you see this small thing down here? Mm -hmm. That was our iPad impact in the year 1900. This one is our impact 1950, and that is 2011. So for clarity, 1900, I've just multiplied the numbers here. For 1900, you have this. For 1950, you have this. And for 2011, you have this. And that is, a, um, that is 1 to 11 to 1,439. Okay? What does the, the figure at the bottom mean? Well, this is simply population times world GDP times number of patents issued. That is the measure for technology that National Geographic came up with. You can discuss these metrics forever and a day, but if you, it, I think it doesn't matter if you come up with 1,439 or with 1,100, or even if you come up with 900 or 700, I think there is a point to take home here. So in 111 years, our impact has increased more than 1,000 fold. Let's get back to water. And let's first talk about water and wildlife habitat, water and conservation. And that is my first case study. And I'm going to take you to a remote place. That is Lhasa in Tibet. And the message here is that nature is often, if not always, a highly political issue. And that is one of the realms where we can actually think about a solution. Because politics, there is no natural law in politics. You can change it. And I talked to somebody last night and said, 
national states are a pretty young invention and couldn't we think of a world without national states? I think we could. So both the exiled Tibetan government and the Chinese government are rewriting the past of this patch of land here, which is a wetland, for the sake of domination in a contested political space. And I want to quote George Orwell here, the past was erased, the erasure was forgotten, the lie became truth. That is exactly what happens in Lalu wetland. And to give you some context, this is China, we've had it. Um, this, is the, this is Tibet, and here's Lhasa, the capital of the region. The wetland at the moment is about six square kilometers. It lies to the northwest of Lhasa, uh, and it's a showcase project of China's engagement for environmental protection in Tibet. It's been a nature preserve since 1999. And between 2002 and 2004, the Chinese government invested 12 million US dollars worth in the preservation of this wetland. And now let's get into it. What you can see here are aerial photographs from 1966 and 2000. And what you can immediately see here is that it doesn't look the same in these two years. And obviously, very much to the south of this thing, things have happened. Here is the city, which is growing. And I mean, you've done that, right? You've looked at the Lago Maggiore. It's perfect to have a seafront view with your house there. But if everybody wants a seafront uh, piece, then there's no open space left where you could walk around if you don't own a house here. So people want to be near the green, nice lungs of Lhasa and encroach this wetland. Here's a picture from November 2003. And in this nature preserve, there's obviously a very linear structure here. And there's pretty linear structures here, which to my knowledge don't usually come up in nature unless it's a crystal. What does it look like? Well, green pasture, high rises in the back. Um, some parts of it look more like what you think of <coughs> as a wetland should look like. There's some water there. And there's 20 of these stones around and people can go look at this beautiful nature preserve. It's a contested space. The exiled Tibetans claim that before the Chinese invasion, the Tibetans lived in harmony with nature, guided by Buddhist principles, and the environment was destroyed by the Chinese. Now, guess what? That's not the story that the Chinese tell, right? The Chinese tell the story that Tibetans cannot protect nature by their own means. Nature preserves are the modern way of protecting nature, and this whole sort of, you know, uh, um, Sustainable peasant management just doesn't hold true. Both aim to protect nature for the sake of the nation. This is ecological nationalism. And there's many more of these examples around. For the Chinese government, nature in Tibet has no human history. Tibetan ecology is kind of primeval. They are, these people are part of nature, ecological Indians. The exiled Tibetans and the Chinese government agree on one thing only, and that is before 1951, nature was used passively and without a master plan. Only the Tibetans say yes, and that's why it was used sustainably, and the Chinese say yes, that's why it was used unsustainably. And only thereafter comes planned land use. And both, to make this claim, totally ignore the local history of the region. And that's why I'm going to tell you this local history in a minute. Also, and we've had that in this Jordan thing, um, Chinese conservation projects play a key role in how they claim to manage Tibet wisely. And so nature becomes a, an, an issue in a conflict. So what's the history of this? 
Actually, in the 18th century, several aristocratic families possessed and used parts of this wetland. The largest part was used by the Tibetan government to produce fodder for their horses. Um, and until the 1950s, it had a rich floral and faunal diversity. After 1950, the water table went down, the wetland became drier, plant and animal ch life changed profoundly. Remember that this is a nature preserve. The water level of this beautiful wetland was manipulated prior to 1950. Yearly, people would erect embankments uh, at specific locations every year to block water flowing out of the low-lying reaches of the wetland into the nearby river. And this was called lifting the water. This was to flood the wetland on purpose to increase reed productivity, which was used to fodder, as fodder for the horses. And as soon as the summer rain started, the people actually had, they had overseers, and these overseers hired the residents to take down the embankments. And this facilitated, because the water level went down, it was easier to harvest the grass. This is a nature preserve today. So what was Maoist ideology doing with nature here? Maoists saw this wetland as unused space because it wasn't agriculturally used. And the ideology was that every single space of unused land must be used, all else is waste. The wetland is useless, it needs to be drained to produce fields for agriculture. In the reform through labor movement uh, in the Cultural Revolution, forced labor was used to dig drainage ditches. And I showed you this one linear structure which goes right through that wetland. That's one of the ditches they were digging there. And that was hard labor. It was a total failure. Neither rice nor grain would grow there. And the project was abandoned in the 1960s, but the drainage remained. So what you could see in the 1960s was not nature. No way. But by the mid-1990s, when environmental protection finally began as a wonderful new way of engaging with nature, um, this managed water-clogged wetland had been reduced to half of its earlier size, and the marsh reeds, which people had so carefully managed, had mostly disappeared, more grassland than marsh. Now have a look at it and have a look at it more closely and then look at the, the ditches that have been dug. These are still there. And there's something else that happened in this upper reach of the wetland. Um, there was a sand channel and in 1975 this whole channel which was to take sand out of the wetland was totally dismantled and the and the river confluence was moved over there so that more space for building could be had. And the northeast corner of this, this was the sand channel was a management thing. It was not a natural thing. But by 1975, they had abandoned the old management and this was buried in sand. And the, the remedy digging retention pits didn't work. Unintended consequences of interventions into nature are the norm, not the exception. Urbanization encroached this wetland and they built a, the middle trunk channel in 1992, funded by the UN World Food Program Agricultural Development Project. And the purpose of this channel was um, it should flow adjacent to the southern edge of the wetland for city beautifications and a series of sluices should enable drainage and agricultural land could then be irrigated. The sluices were never built. Instead, the channel was used for waste dumping. 70% of the wetland fell dry due to this channel. And then a fence was erected. 12 million bucks 
This is the amount that the Chinese government spent between 2002 and 2004 went into this fence. And I have to admit, it's a beautiful fence. It's a very nice fence. Um, the Laza Municipal Environmental Protection Bureau prohibited further farmland reclamation, clothes washing, digging for wetland turf, for lawns. It prohibited fishing and vegetable farming. It prohibited basically everything that people had been doing there. And it planted 7,500 pine and willow trees along the main Arteridge Kennel. Um, it also forbade horse riding. And it established more than 20 of these nature <laughs> conservation area signs, which you saw. <laughs> and what did we end up with? Nature and humans were conveniently separated. There was the fence. Great. Only the wetland birds didn't come back just because of the fence, because they are not interested in fences. They're interested in marshland, which had, by that point, dried out. And the black-necked crane had been exterminated by Chinese soldiers because that was an easy way to prove their dominance. Any, everybody else was prohibited from killing them, and they could shoot them as a pastime. So, what the Chinese government actually does is it secures its sovereignty by claiming nature protection. Mm -hmm. And in order to be able to claim it by means of nature protection, it has to be claimed that it's primeval, that it's nature, and that the Tibetans didn't have anything to do with it in, the, in previous times. It looks a little bit like a national park done by Americans, these beautiful boardwalks here, and another of these stones. In the process of appropriation, local residents were deprived of rights of potentially sustainable <coughs> use. A landscape with a rich cultural history has been declared first a wasteland and later a space of primeval nature. And engineering and interventions have changed the ecology of this wetland forever. And both Chinese and Tibetans ignore the history of Lalu to fit it into their nationalist rhetoric. And as I said, that's not the only part of wetland nature which has undergone similar fate. Let's move to water and land reclamation, because I want to drive home another point. Let's go into long-term side effects of interventions into ecosystems specially designed to please Eva Hoagland, <laughs> um, a citizen of the Netherlands. Now, I'm going to give you a quick overview of the most northern and the most southern part of the Netherlands, and this is a geological map. And what you can see here green are saltwater marshes. And what you can see here in this, um, I don't know, pinkish tone, um, these are marshes. This is turf land. That is, that is peat land. And you can see that this land was dynamic before humans were there. It was also dynamic when humans were already there. Peat swamps are fragile ecosystems with important biological and hydrological functions. Pressure for land has resulted in reclamation of sus really substantial areas of peat swamps to make these waterlogged lands suitable for agriculture or for other land use. But as soon as you drain peatland, what happens? An irreversible process of subsidence, of shrinking of this land starts, mm -hmm. which can be arrested only by one means, and that is put the water back in. It will actually grow as long as it's waterlogged, but it will shrink as soon as you pump out the water. And this is the story of the Netherlands in one slide. Um, this is the graph of compaction, of the compression of these drained peatlands. And it, around the year 1000, the then inhabitants of the Netherlands started to build irrigation, uh, drainage ditches. And with these 
first straight each ditches, they set in motion this irreversible trend that their land is shrinking. And why did they do it? They did this for entirely cultural reasons. The Franks conquered the Frisians, and the Frisians lived in this delta area of the Rhine and Maas River for a long time before they were catching fish and waterfowl, and they actually enjoyed this wetland there, because it also gave a good means of protection. But the conquerors brought with them the idea that actually real people eat bread. And so agriculture starts to be the fashion. And then if you want to put grain on peatland, you have to drain it. That's what happens. The drain, the drain peat box sink, that is because of the mineralization and oxidation <coughs> of this uh, organic matter. And natural post-glacial um, sea level rise doesn't actually help. So around the year 1250 or so, you can see that the flood tide reaches the height of the land. And what do you do when you're an industrious Netherlands person? You build a dike. If you build a dike and the land sinks further, eventually, what will happen? The groundwater level will reach the surface from below. By 1600, large parts of the arable are below seawater level, and the groundwater has reached the crops. Crops don't enjoy wet feet. So what do you do? You pump. And that's the windmill here. Wind is a, is a very, very good thing in the Netherlands. Always blows from the same direction, blows every day. So you can use windmills very well to drain this land. But for entirely unnatural reason, because of the wars that raged through Europe in the 17th century, and for religious reasons, a lot of people came to the Netherlands, and they were actually relatively rich. Many Protestants came and engaged in trade. Um, a colonial empire was there. And these people needed two things. They needed housing and beer, or anything else to drink. And for housing and beer, um, peat was used. Great idea? Marvelous. <laughs> Large inland lakes formed through peat extraction. And because the winds always came from the same direction, which was good for the windmill, but was bad for the for the encroaching ponds there, because the erosion would kill the inland side of these ponds. I'm going to show you to this in a moment. The Netherlands people call it the water wolf, eating up their land. And as early as 1597, drainage of land below sea level started, which is called a polder, and the poldered area grew steadily. And with the aid of steam and later electrical pumps, the Netherlands were in, able to cope with this by pumping more and more and more fresh water out of the land. But, you know, there's the sea, and below the, the land, there is actually a connection between salt water and fresh water, with a zone of brackish water in between. Now, if you pump a lot of water out on the fresh water side, eventually the salt water will get in there, and you will start to pump out fresh water, and your whole country will be a saline desert. Now just to show you what the Netherlands did between 1250 and 1544, um, look at the 1250 picture. Um, there, are, there are three distinct um, inland lakes by 1544. This has all grown into one large thing, the Ode Harlem Mer. So even before fossil fuels, humans actually had a more localized, but nevertheless pretty intense impact. How many more minutes? OK. <laughs> so good. that will give you another case study, um, unless you ask me to give you one more. Um, eight centimeters per year is the yearly subsidence prognosis for 2,100. 
the parts of the Netherlands, which you can see here in blue, will go down every year eight centimeters. That means within four years, 24 centimeters. That means within 16 years, one meter. That actually is not something that I would call stable. <laughs> so one intervention, well meant, feed people with grains, a thousand years of dealing with the side effects. What do you think we can learn? I think we can learn that cultural decisions, what to eat, what to heat with, what to drink, shape the future of the environment. And we have control over cultural decisions. Long-term legacies and side effects of interventions are important. And if this would like to go on, local environmental histories need to be taken into account for further planning. And I can't resist to use some of my remaining minutes to show you that capitalism and communism are of about the same, um, what should I say, beneficiality for the environment. The great construction projects of communism was a term used for a series of very ambitious construction projects undertaken in the 1950s under command of Joseph Stalin. That's a tale of modernization by water. Electricity, you know Lenin's famous word, um, communism is socialism plus uh, electricity. There you go. <laughs> the Volga Don Canal was constructed between 1948 and 52. Uh, it was constructed predominantly by prisoners detained in specially organized corrective labor camps. The number of convicts employed in construction was more than 100,000. And the canal connects the Volga and the Don River. It's 101 kilometers long. It's an engineering feat. People celebrated it. Um, and you can see it here on the map. I hope you can see it. Um, it's in the, here is the Caspian Sea. Here is the Azov Sea. This is the Black Sea. And there is where the Volga and the Don are connected. And in the last 60 years, between 1934 and 1999, a series of dams was constructed on the Volga, the largest and first one in Volgograd, which was then Stalingrad. Um, the length of the dam, of the, of the, um, of the, of the, the part of the river which is affected by the dam is 600 kilometers. Now, Guess what? Sturgeon spawning grounds on the Volga has gone down from 3,400 hectares in 1934 to less than 600 in 1999. Why should that matter for you? Because sturgeon means caviar. And if you look at sturgeon caviar trade, you can see that this all but collapsed by the year 2004. The Caspian Sea is the world's main producer of wild caviar, 83% in 2003, and it supplies the largest markets. The construction of all these hydroelectric power plants and dams significantly altered the flow of water into the delta and destroyed about 90% of these spawning grounds. Um, and with high levels of water pollution, the sturgeon also suffer from various diseases. According to the FAO statistics, and the FAO is, is not a, a, an organization which should be accused of doing green washing of numbers to make it more sound, more dangerous than it is. 22,000 tons of harvest in 1970, 373 tons in 2008. And Paul Holm could give you the numbers for, I don't know how many other fish catches, fish populations falling totally, breaking down completely. I just chose the Caspian Sea because he has never talked about that before. Um, and then, just to give you a feeling that this is not something which is in these large countries and it's uh, 
and a communism modernization project or it's driven by capitalism. Austria is a relatively tame country in terms of politics. And if you look at what we have done to the river Danube between 1715 and 1995, you will see that there is no natural part of this river in Austria anymore. This is 30 kilometers. And Milena has seen these slides, but I still let it, it, it goes up and down in time. But so, I was counting on you showing Yeah, I know, I know. I, I know I had to show them. Okay. So I put them there at the very end so you couldn't cut me off <laughs> short. But I can show you another picture here of the same thing. It's not moving. We have printed all the the routes of the routes of ships from 1700 to 1995. And there you can see how this river moved through the landscape. And now we just want it straight and we want it there and nowhere else. And for that, this is a detailed map of some part of this. This is uh, 10 kilometers across. From the 1820s onwards, people have put regulation measures into this river. And this is a pretty nondescript part of rural Austria. If you look at the Viennese Danube, though, and these you don't know, Milena, because they are <laughs> pretty new, okay. <laughs> you can see that in 1570, Vienna is here. It's at a side channel, a relatively tame side channel of the Danube. And this wild river here is part of the protection of the city because an army can't get through here easily. And, by, and, and the Viennese are troubled by the fact that this, actually, this side channel is drying out. So they are fighting to keep the water near the city. And by 1849, they have constructed lots and lots and lots of things to move the water down there. Now look at this. You can see how this changed. But it all didn't help, and so by 1912, they had constructed a completely artificial channel. Let me go back. You can see that the river never was there from the 1570s onwards. It's a completely artificial channel which was built. And the question here is, how sustainable are regulated rivers? How will we maintain regulation infrastructures when energy becomes scarcer and thus more expensive? And which spiral of risk is that? And I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you. <laughs>